Tonight, a super hydrophobic coating gives you superpowers against drunks, then no doctor drops in to tell you all about the dark side of the internet. Padre's Corner is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padre's Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to Padre's Corner. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. Padre's Corner is the show where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane on the other side. Now, I know we have been gone from Fridays. This is actually where we started. Just a, a chance to talk with the chat room, the, the good geeks and gals, the boys and the girls, all the nerds who wanted to take a look at some of the stories that fell through the cracks of the week. Well, Padre's Corner is back on Fridays, and guess what? It's because we love you. Now, let's get straight into it. As you may know, I love me some freaking science. The only thing I love more than some freaking science is some freaking engineering. And boy, do we've got a doozy for you tonight. Now, if you've been on the Internet, you've probably heard about oleophobic or hydrophobic materials. Now, we've this is a specific type of oleophobic slash hydrophobic material called a super hydrophobic coating. This is a material that creates a nanoscopic surface layer that can repel water and other liquids. Now, these can be made from many different types of materials. You can make it from manganese oxide polystyrene, precipitated calcium carbonate, zinc oxide polystyrene, silica, even carbon nanotubes. But no matter what kind of material you use, they all work the same way. And that is, they hold a very thin layer, molecules of air, on top of their surface. Now that layer of air keeps the liquid from ever touching the coated material. So it's not like it, it's, it repels the liquid from the material. The liquid never even touches what this, this super hydrophobic material is coating. Now there have been suggested applications in heavy industry, medical, and of course in consumer electronics. But one neighborhood in Germany has come up with a more novel approach, a slightly different use for these super high-tech materials, and that is to clean up the neighborhood. Now, this neighborhood is known as the uh, St. Pauli Quarter in Hamburg, Germany, and they've got a problem. You see, it's the party zone. It's the red light district. It's the place where people go to get drunk, and unfortunately, people get drunk, and then they do what drunk people do, which is they pee on the neighborhood. Well, the folks in this neighborhood got tired of it, so they started coating the walls with the super hydrophobic material. And evidently, because you've got that layer of repulsion, anyone who pees on a wall will get their feet wet. That's right, folks. This is science in action. This is a neighborhood saying, hey, look, let's take a look at this, this space age application of material. This thing that could be used in medical uh, institutions, could be used in super fantastic consumer electronics, and instead, let's clean ourselves up. Now, they, they have run into a few issues. The first is that the coating does wash off, so it has to be reapplied every once in a while. It's also kind of expensive, so you can't really coat every surface in the neighborhood. Also, it pulls on the ground, so even if you keep walls from getting hosed off by your streams of injustice, you're going to have that smell. But what they have found is that by posting signs and by letting people know that they'll never know what surface they're peeing on, They've uh, made their super hydrophobic into super nestophobic. Now, when we come back, we've got a special guest on the show. I'm bringing in O Doctor. That's right. If you've watched Twit TV, you've probably seen him before. But before we get to that, as I am wont, let's go ahead and take a look at the tech. I have a problem. I'm going to be taking a trip pretty soon, and I love my Acer S7. It's a, it's a fantastic little ultrabook. I've used it for everything from collecting data to doing simple word processing and even video editing. It's a competent video editing machine. The problem is where I'm going, I'm going to be editing a lot and a lot and a lot of video, and that S7 is just not going to keep up, not on the deadlines that I have. So I went to my friends over at Acer, and I said, well, what do you got? What do you have that I could possibly use 
that would be faster than an S7, but the same size, the same format, maybe a little bit heavier, something that brings out the guns, and what they sent to me was some nitro. You're a gamer or a graphics professional. You want an ultra-fast, stylish notebook with a high-resolution, large color balance screen, a fast processor, even faster storage, a ton of memory, and you don't want to break the bank. Usually high performance and affordable don't go together, but usually didn't have the Aspire V15 Nitro Black Edition from Acer. A gaming-themed notebook with a 4K screen and enough horsepower to drive it. All for under $1,500. Our review unit, the VN7591G, measures 15.34 inches by 10.14 inches by less than an inch thick and 5.29 pounds heavy. It packs a fourth-generation Intel Haswell quad-core i7-4710HQ running at 2.5 GHz with a turbo speed of 3.5 GHz and 6 MB of cache. 16 GB of dual-channel DDR3 memory feeds the CPU and complements the 2 GB of dedicated GDDR5 that feeds the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 860M. In other words, holy crap. All that power pushes the pixels for the Nitro's Black signature bragging right. A 15.6 inch 3840x2160 4K Ultra HD screen. In the past, I've been critical of 4K displays on notebooks because I haven't really been able to tell the difference between a 2K and a 4K panel that's less than 17 inches. The Nitro Black changed my opinions because of one thing the matte finish. Unlike glossy displays that can hide pixels behind super saturated colors and glossy lensing, the screen on the Nitro Black lets you see every beautiful pixel. And because it is a matte finish, you'll get far better color reproduction than you would on a glossy screen. It's a media professional's dream. Let's talk about storage. On many notebooks, you're forced to choose between an ultra-fast solid-state drive, an ultra-large hard drive, or a hybrid drive that gives you the capacity of a hard drive and some of the speed of an SSD. Not with the Nitro Black. Acer packed it with both an M2 slot hosting a 256GB SSD and a 2.5-inch SATA bay with a 1TB hard drive. And unlike most hybrid setups, you can access each storage device separately, meaning that you get to choose what goes on your uber-fast storage and what can be put on the rotating drive. All this tech means that the Nitro Black benches quite well. It scored an average of 3010 with a low of 2966 in PC Mark 8, 6100 in PC Mark 7, and 5149 in 3D Mark 11. But the Nitro Black isn't all specs. It feels solid, with just a little flex in the backlit full-size keyboard with numeric keypad and the oversized multi-touchpad. Acer uses a ridged backing on the screen to prevent smudges and covered the user surfaces in a rubberized texture that just feels good. Audio on the Nitro Black is good. Definitely the best notebook audio I've heard all year. Four speakers provide plenty of volume and even an abundance of bass, though the down-firing speakers sometimes can be muddled on an uneven surface. The connectivity expansion and networking on the Nitro Black is also good, with a caveat. It sports a combo audio port, three USB 3.0 ports, full HDMI, an expandable gigabit Ethernet jack, media card reader, 802.11abgn Bluetooth 4.0 with a MIMO antenna to increase throughput and sensitivity, and a 720p web camera. What it lacks is DisplayPort or Thunderbolt expansion. The three-cell battery is rated for four hours, but you're probably not going to see that unless it's at its lowest power setting. Doing standard web browsing with the Wi-Fi on, I ran the Nitro Black empty in just under three hours. Watching video with the Wi-Fi off, I drained the battery in about three and a half hours. Gaming online or rendering video dropped the battery life to just over one and a half hours. You're gonna wanna pack the power adapter. In the end, the Acer Aspire V15 Nitro Black Edition VN7591G is a desktop replacement notebook that does exactly as advertised. Give great performance, gaming style, and functionality at a price point that's tough to match. I I really wasn't sure if I wanted a 4K display just because I, I don't see that much use for it. But I got to say, with that matte finish, this is finally a notebook that I can get behind. I, I have seen 4K notebooks before, but most of them do that glossy covering, which makes the colors pop. But that's actually bad if you're a creative professional because it changes what colors actually look like. I can't take a glossy notebook, even if it's 4K, to an event and do production on it because I'm not going to get the right color balance. Acer gets that. And so what they give you is a notebook that's going to give you poor, pure 4K. It's not amped up. It's not on steroids. It's not color saturated. What you see on the screen is what is going to render. And I like that. 
I also like the fact that you can get this in a couple, couple of different styles. You can get this black edition, which includes the 4K, but you can also get Full HD, which is 1080p. You could also get a 17-inch version now. And this, this version that I actually tested right now, you can find between $1,300 and $1,500. That's, that's not actually that bad if what you really want is a creation machine. So if you are one of these folks who likes beautiful quality video, if you're one of these folks who's a creative professional and you want to be able to do video and photo editing on the go, if you're one of these folks who wants a desktop replacement that really does replace the desktop, well, then take a look at the Acer V15 Black Nitro Edition. Now, this is my favorite part of the show. This is where I get to bring interesting people onto Padre's Corner to ask them how they found themselves internet famous. And folks, today's guest is definitely internet famous. I introduce to you, that's right, O Doctor, Owen J.J. Stone. O Doctor, thank you very much for coming on the Padre's Corner. Thanks for having me, Captain. And unlike you, I'm not a real doctor. I just put that on my name, so it sounds like I'm professional, whereas you are a real father. <laughs> and, and it's just a whole convoluted thing. People come to me all the time, like, are you a real doctor? And sometimes I say yes, depending on how good looking they are. Uh, sometimes I tell the truth. You, you know, so. I, I don't get caught up on titles, and I got to say, you wear the doctor title a whole lot better than I do. So points to you, sir. It, points it, to you. It, especially because it's, uh, it's urbanized, so that way I can't get sued by anybody. <laughs> <That's> always, <laughs> always important. Always important. Right. Uh, th think there, ahead. You know, I, I think the first time I ever, I ever heard that in a, a comedy situation. Do you remember? I, I think it was the Fat Boys. Uh, it had Dennis. There was a movie with Dennis O'Leary and two rappers who had become cops, and one of them. Yeah. Uh, do you, I can't. <sighs> that wasn't the Fat Boys. I can't remember. Who's the who, man? It's who's, who's the, the man? man? It was. Thank it you. It was Freddie and uh, uh, now I can't think of his name. It's driving me crazy. It's, they're from Yum TV Raps. Yeah, the, yeah. What the heck is the fat guy's name? No. Freddie and they're two. It's a combo, dude. The one dude's real skinny, yep. and the other dude's a real big guy. Yep. And it, the movie is Who's the Man Now? I know. I know the movie is Who's the Man. I don't think it's on Netflix, but I'm pretty sure I have it in my queue somewhere. So I'm gonna have to go find that. Now, uh, oh, doctor, I, I got to ask you. Your name has been synonymous with the internet for, internet for me. Sometimes even when I didn't know why, you were always there, always giving advice, always a consultant, always a creative professional. What is it that you do? If someone were to come up to you and say, what do you do? I mean, I see, I see you on Twitter. I see you on the internet. I see you on multiple podcasts. What is it that you bring? So in general, what somebody asks me, what do I do? I tell people that I make people happy. Um, so I've done everything. I used to code i used to um back when it was flash and i was coding websites for that um never any apps or anything like that and now i do social and i still do web development but literally like when i say i don't do anything or what i do people email me or send me stuff all the time and if i can't help that person i usually connect them to someone that i can help them so technically i never say that i can't do anything because even if i can't do it I like to find myself as a middleman or a connector to find someone to make them happy. So I usually never tell anybody no. And uh, what I do is referenced or um, sent to me by other people. I, I always get referrals for work. So long story short, if you ask me what I did, I had to tell you a real answer because that's a convoluted BS answer. I work with a lot of PR companies and I run campaigns for things, um, social campaigns or web campaigns to either generate likes or followers or clicks or things like that for companies. And I usually work with PR companies because they're easier and they already have clients and I don't have to deal with people directly. So a lot of people pay me for ideas and to sit around and tell them yes or no if something's right. I, I had a good friend who um, I, I trust his opinion and, and what he told me about you was, oh, oh, doctor, yeah, he's like black ops for an internet generation. If you need something <laughs> done, if you need to get the word out, if you have a project that you need to promote, if you have a project you need to finish, He's the person that you bring in to to fix your mess. I'm like, oh, okay, that that makes sense. Now I get it. Yeah, and I and I usually it's funny because I I like being hidden and quiet because I I realized a long time ago once the, the social thing blew up that people want to pay to take your ideas and take them as their own. So when I work with people, I have a clause that says for 10, I'll never even say that I did anything. 
Like you want to add 10% on your bill, you can take credit for it. You can have it. It's all yours. So I like keeping things quiet. And when I do work for somebody, someone usually refers me to other work. And I live a lifestyle where I don't have to work all the time. I, I've I finally gotten to the point where, you know, that whole four hour work week thing, I'm on that setup and I work enough to save some money and live a regular life. And I'm totally content and happy with that because I get to spend more time with my kid. All right. All right. In other words, you're someone who's figured out what's important to them, and uh, you yeah. do you do the stuff you need to do to take care of the things that are important to you. Yes. Good lesson. Good lesson. Yeah. Now, it's, it's, uh, I'm sorry. I, I just I was just going to say that uh, I I want to I want to go back because we always do this. We're going to well, I want to talk about your history that brought you to this. But before you we do that, there was something that you mentioned on Twit a few weeks back, and I I found it very refreshing and very interesting. Specifically, you were talking about Twitter. Uh, and uh, and other social media services like it that are so focused on follows and so focused on likes, which is not bad. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good goal. It's, it's a good thing to have. But you had an interesting philosophy. If we look at your Twitter account, which you pointed out on the show, you've got, you know, 7,851 followers because you're, you're not actively trying to build up your personal brand. You build up other people's brands. But yeah. something you said was, I'm not about the numbers I'm about engagement. And you said, look, I can I can do a tweet right now and get engagement from all 7,851 followers because they're real people, because they're actual folks who are interested in what I do, interested in what I promote. And for you, that's far more powerful than having a million and a half followers, 99% uh, of which are just bots. I really personally look at Twitter as a living Rolodex for me. Um, for me personally, that's how I look at it. I look at it as, you know, quote unquote, I'll just I'll name drop inside the system so I don't sound like a D-bag. But like if I wanted to talk to Leo, I have his phone number, I have his address, but sometimes I just want to connect to him. So it's easier for me to DM him or whatever. Now, I mean, you can DM everybody. But back in the day, it was you can only DM somebody who followed you. So for me, getting viable, important people to follow me and, and care about me was crucial to me building my black ops business because those people were the ones that were important to get a hold of. So if I, if I could get, you know, a Leo Laporte, a Kevin Rose, a Jace Calcanis, you know, somebody to listen to me and care about what I have to say, I know that I can tap them when I want to in a system, in a cycle that's not, you know, calling up on the phone or sending them an email because certain people like that get it inundated with so much information. So for me, I use it as a living personal index. And for the regular quote unquote people that follow me, you know, if somebody messages me, I always try to answer them back no matter what they say, you know, because even when people dog me, like I get on Twitter and I, I get a lot of hate because I'm not a quote unquote tech journalist and I don't have credentials to some people and people rip me apart. And because I answer them within about two or three tweets, they're like, dude, I love you. I'm sorry. You know, I was just trolling on you. I didn't mean to get into you like that. I, I didn't know because they think I'm going to not respond. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they think they can come in and say something and run away. But when I respond to them and usually it's like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm not that smart. It's not a big deal. Are, are you smarter than me? If you are, then teach me something. Let me know. And uh, I, I like to keep it organic. I, I, I really use it as a living Rolodex for me. That's that's what my social connections are. Uh, we actually do have a story that we're going to talk about a little bit later that, that ties directly into that. But let's go ahead and tease it a little bit. Something that you mentioned, this this whole idea of responding to someone who is obviously trolling. I, I'm still not very good at it. Uh, I like poking back even when I know I shouldn't. And it, 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 you live in this. I mean, this, this, is, this is your work. This is what you do. This is your profession. Dealing with people who use the anonymity of the internet and the power that you get in a wide distribution tool like Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or whatever it's going to be, to say things that they would never say to your face. And not because they're afraid of you, but just because you, you don't do that. And if you know someone's going to communicate back, there's, there's certain things that you don't talk about. That's, that's one of your areas of expertise, right? I mean, because you've had to handle that when yeah. companies start having trouble with trolls. Yeah, and there, there's like one of two th The first thing, first and foremost, everybody needs to calm down when they talk about internet trolls or internet bullying or, you know, people ripping on people. That is throughout time. I'm sure that people used to send carrier pigeons to tell the other king that he's a doofus. I, <laughs> I, I believe that throughout time, it's always been that way. Before internet and social and all that kind of stuff, players, like I forget what that umpire was, we had a bad call on some World Series game and the other team won. He got death threats and letters 
200,000 letters in the first year. Lost his job, came, had anxiety, uh, went on disability. Like, the guy's never worked again since then. And that was before the internet or Twitter or cell phones or anything. He just got physical mail sent to his house and, and stuff put on his lawn. So it, the way you deal with it is the way you always have to deal with it. There's a couple of avenues you can take. But the first and foremost thing is when people say, oh, the internet. No, it, it's people are evil and people are great. There's good in the world and there's bad in the world. And you can't just say, oh, the Internet's making it bad because people will always find a way to be mean or rude or cruel. So that's the first thing you have to just accept that. Don't think, oh, well, now that I shouldn't be on Twitter, because guess what? If you're not on Twitter, they will find your email address and they'll write you an email. You know, they'll find your P.O. box and they will send you mail. They will find a way to hate on you, regardless of whether you want to get off of Twitter and I can't stand the Internet. Um, that kind of hatred and, and, and evil is out there. And uh, the best way to deal with it, if you're a person and in your regular a, a personal brand, is just to accept it. And if it's not your forte to respond, then just ignore it. Um, and if you're a brand, then you have to, if there's a large tidal wave of things that people are saying the same things over and over again, you might have to look at yourself. You know, uh, McDonald's has a huge problem right now with their food. And they can't just sit there and ignore 100,000, a million people saying, hey, why aren't your nuggets... What's wrong with your nuggets? Somebody's got to respond to that. Somebody's got to have a statement, even if it's a cookie cutter response. Some things you have to respond to. Some things you should let roll off your back. Right, right. And it, there's there's something else to this, which is, as you mentioned, hate existed way before the internet. But one of the things that the, that the internet has done is it it's made it very easy for the person who's being hated on or the the brand that's being hated on to hear the hate. I mean, it used to be just seething hate of, oh, I hate it when that song comes on the radio. I hate it when that person's on the TV. But now it could be, I tweet that so-and-so is a talentless hack. Uh, and, and as you said, you know, we really have two different ways to, to deal with it. We can accept it or we can ignore it. But the way that I would deal with it as a person in a relationship is I would say something like, you know, that thing that you said, that actually kind of hurt me. I really wish you wouldn't say it. But that's surrender on the Internet, right? I mean, that's that's like worst case scenario is you tell them that they're getting to you. Um, well, <laughs> Never surrender. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't know what general ever said it. I don't know what that is. Never surrender. Like, again, to, to a point, exactly reference to myself, when someone says, I don't know why this guy's on Twit. He doesn't know anything about this or that. And I say, well, tell me what I didn't know or tell me what I could do better. And then usually they'll have a response that's either, one, uh, I can't tell you anything because you don't know anything, or it's, oh, well, shoot, you know, well, here's a link to this site you could have read about, blah, 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 if you want to learn about it. You know, there's only one or two ways people are going to take it because when the, the best thing is you get that instant response back to somebody. So like you said, now you can instantly say, I don't like that song. If you said right now, I don't like Taylor Swift, and Taylor Swift responded to you, you would instantly love Taylor Swift. Because you're like, whoa, Taylor Swift just said something to me? I, I'm sorry, Taylor. Uh, I didn't like that song, but I love the other, Remember that song? And then my daughter loves it. I didn't mean it. Because the shock value to that person of being responded to, because they usually think they could put it on ether and nobody sees it. I mean, most trolls, if you look at their pages, they have 32 followers, 42 followers, and you're going to go get enraged because out of the thousands of tweets that you got or thousands of Facebook messages you got, you're going to go rip on this one guy. And... Half the time, people don't even see it and they pass right by it. And if you have a good brand, if you have a quality brand, other people are going to attack that person for you. Right now, if somebody ripped on me and it was like bad, I know other people are going to come into that chat, into that system, and into that setup and defend me. And if not, I'm going to go make a secret account and then defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about sock puppeting is actually big <laughs> on the internet. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so we've established what you do. We established who you are. You got your cred. You got your credentials. Let's step back a little bit. Where does O Doctor come from? Um, I was born in Washington State, uh, moved around a ton. My dad was in the Air Force when I was a kid. Uh, tell you a quick, awesome story. My dad was the baby of 11 kids. And since he was in the Air Force, he was divorced from my mom. My grandfather said, hey, you shouldn't have your son on all these bases. Give me your son and I will take care of him. And my dad sent me to go live with my grandfather from when I was like two till I was seven. And the day my grandfather passed away, my dad came and got me and I went back to go live with my dad. But I always thought to myself, man, my dad gave me away. And my grandfather told me on the last day, he was like, 
don't ever think your dad didn't love you. I asked for you because I knew I wasn't going to live that long. And I want to spend time with you. Wow. And I was like, man, if he didn't tell me that, I would think this dude didn't care about me and sent me on my way and blah, 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 blah. So I moved around a lot. I've traveled a lot. Um, my dad was in the Air Force. Like I said, he was an engineer fixing planes and jets. Got out of that. Then he was working on cars and stuff like that. He got hurt one day. Then he got into computers because his hands weren't working right. So then I got a computer. I got a new computer every year. And my dad was awesome. I was, I'm not as smart as him. He's a technical person. I'm a thinking person. He is a hands-on hard. He was a, He passed away. He's a hands-on hardware guy. So I, I took as much of that as possible. But as soon as software came into play and coding came into play, I was all about that because having tiny little screwdrivers in my hand and build my own system was way too annoying for me because it's so tedious. But I, uh, I've been on the internet for a long time. I love the internet. I love computers. I love people. People's my favorite thing. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, I had uh, Steve Gibson on one of my other shows, Coding 101, and we were talking about this, this proclivity to do things with technology. And for some people, it's hardware. And for some people, it's software. Some people, it's a combination of the two. But it's, it's fascinating to hear you say, look, you were around computers. Your father had computers. In fact, do you, do you remember what your first computer was? I think it was a Tandy. Like a, a, a trash 80, like a TRS? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It, it's it a was, classic. It was, and I was the only one in my school that had one. Like, I had people come over to my house to do their reports for school because they could actually type. That was back when people still had typewriters in their house, too. So I was the only kid with a computer. And it was, I was like, you can't do anything on it. I got a floppy disk and we can type Word on it. And I can, you know, download some pictures from some obscure site back then. You know, that was like pre-ICQ and all that stuff. So it was... Having a computer didn't really mean anything other than, man, you got a computer? Wait, That's I, cool. I, I got to ask this then. Did you become the kid at school that they would go to whenever they had a technical problem? Like the, the, the TV wasn't working or computer wasn't working? Yeah, that, that was always the case. Like I had summer jobs. Like I, the first iPad, if you want to call it iPad, it was a Sony pad and it controlled the TV. You could play games on it. You know, the thing cost $2,000. I worked all summer to buy this thing. It literally did four things. It was a remote control for my TV, remote control for the stereo, and I played solitaire on it. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I I used to buy all those things, and all my friends thought that uh, I knew. Uh, back then, I could fix computers. Back then, like I said, my dad was really hands-on. He taught me a lot. Um, I've evolved from that since, like, 2004. I couldn't do it anymore. So now people ask me, oh, my computer's broke. I'm like, they're 200 bucks. Go buy a new one. Like, it's trash. It's <laughs> Windows. Don't bother me about it being broke. So, so obviously you've got you've got the computer background, you've got the tech background, but then you mentioned you found software, and evidently that clicked. Like, what what way? What made it? What made it so that you looked at software or, or programming, code development? And you said, "Oh no, 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 that's that's what I should be doing." So, uh, you asked me earlier, like, where my background in computers. Let me tell you. So, in two thousand and one. Um, with my friend, uh, he was in college. I dropped out of college because I wanted to travel. Uh, we started a web company where we would build surveys and we were selling them to like Maxims or other dumb magazines or sites. We would make love, sex surveys or life surveys, you know, 50 questions. What's your favorite position? What kind of cookie do you like? And we were making those and selling them. And that was really cool. And then we realized like that's not really making us any money because back then they don't really pay for anything. So like, instead of making these, let's make websites. And I really liked Flash because I liked moving things. I loved coding things that moved. And once I had made something and a line would fly across the screen or like stuff would flow, that was really, really awesome to me. I just loved the fact that I could make things. I could see it actually like art. You know, it was like making art. And um, my friend was much, much smarter than me. He now works for Lockheed and Martin. He makes an absorbent ton of money, travels the world. He he is a real black ops guy at uh at, at uh, Lockheed Martin now, but he got to the point where he was coding twice as fast as me and he was so quick and it was, well, okay, well then I'll just do the design work. <laughs> you, you got the code down. You're, you're way quicker than me. I'll start doing the design cause I like the art part of it. Then I met a friend who was so good at design. I was like, here, make this blue, make that red, make that yellow. And they were so quick at it. They did everything I had in my mind. So I stopped doing design. And so literally like when it comes to software or anything like that, once I find someone that can do what I see in my mind because I'm so mentally creative, I stick with that person. And if I have to replace that person, I will. But it's also ruined me for doing things. Once I stop coding, I don't ever want to look at a little line of code again. 
like it, it, it ruined it for me. Once I stopped doing my, my design and got out of Photoshop, I didn't want to deal with layers again. I'm like, oh my God, I got to make 14 layers for one thing. So it's been one of those things where I've done everything. I just progressed out of it into something else. And I think that's my problem with everything because uh, master of all trades or jack of all trades, master of none situation is what I find myself in. Because I think I might have ADD when it comes to the internet. Like once I find one thing, I love it. I fall in love with it. And then I get out of it. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing though. I mean, because... That's that's the kind of people that you need. Yeah, it's it's nice to have a Superman every once in a while who does everything, knows everything, can answer every single question. But one of the things that we don't put enough value on are the people who know a little bit about everything and then can delegate and can say, well, I've got a big picture here, so I'm going to bring in you, you, and you, and you because those are the pieces that I need, and this is what I need to do, and I'm going to trust you to put that together. That's and, that's one of those things that makes a successful company in today's uh, internet world. It, and it's really the people's skill set. Like, I have a friend who does my web development. Now, if you had to talk to him one-on-one -on -one for five minutes, he'd be the nicest person in the world. After 10 minutes, he hates you because <laughs> he lives and breathes code. Like, his mental fortitude is for numbers and letters and things that work. And once he finds out you're not as smart as he is, he cannot stand to talk to you. He becomes rude and agitated, and he doesn't want to answer your questions. So I know enough to say, okay, we well, need to tweak this or tweak that. I really don't know what the code is, but I have a general gist of it. So when he explains it to me, I understand it's not like talking to a novice. So me and him work very well together because I know well enough to stay out of his way, and he knows that if he has to explain something he's annoyed about, I might be able to answer that problem for him. So... You're, you're definitely right about that. It, 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 it's helped me um, tremendously just to know a little bit about something, you know. Right now, I'm, I'm into photography. Uh, before I was into video, like I used to do video podcasts all the time. And um, it, it's nice when you have a, a small sampling of a lot of different things. Oh, oh Doctor, uh, I'm, I'm going to say something. It may sound insulting. It's totally not made to sound insulting. That's what they always say. That's what they always say. Not to offend you. But. Not to offend you, but I'm totally <laughs> going to offend you now. No, but, but both of us are of a generation where the, the Internet developed during our lives. It did not exist when we were growing up. It was something that came into existence. And for the longest time, there was, there was a decade or maybe even a decade and a half when people saw it as it was something that was interesting, something that maybe had a promise. But especially at the beginning, none of us knew that it would be something that you could make a living on. It wasn't something that, that would be the next big thing that would drive the economy of the country. So when did you make that transition of thinking it's interesting? Because obviously you had an early interest in computers. You had an earliest interest in software. But when did you transition to, you know what? I can do this for a living. I'm good at this. I have a, a very unique perspective on this. And I think people would pay me to help them do this. So... I'll give you a timeline because it's quicker that way. So in 2002, we were doing surveys and that kind of stuff. By 2003, 2004, we were making websites. By 2005, so about a, it's about a year's time, by 2005, um, I was a club and party promoter. I, basically, I've had the same website since 2002, and I've literally flipped it into different categories every couple of years. I just keep it because it's a short URL. And um, I was doing party promotion, and we would go to clubs, and we'd take pictures. We'd have the survey up. We'd have our own playlist for music and stuff like that for people. Um, we even made those those little boxes for MySpace so people could play our playlist from the uh, parties we were throwing on there. And then after that, um, I was still doing the parties, and I had a kid. I took two years off. So around 2007, I saw the video podcasts and uh, the, the internet TV shows and um, that's when I first started watching uh, Twit area right around there. And I said, man, I'm really personable. I shouldn't be sitting behind a computer. I should be talking to people and out mingling with people and having fun. And so what I did was I started doing my own podcast, my own show, and literally I willed myself into getting to meet important people and I cheated into my way into the internet. Like my whole goal to make, because I've always made money on the internet since I've been doing it. It was, you know, make a website, this and that, dumb things. But I saw that larger amount of money and I said, man, if I could just get with the right people, I know that I have information that I can share with people. So I started doing my show and I got to interview, you know, Jay Adelson, finally got to interview Leo, you know, and once people saw me with those important people, 
then my price tag went up because they had value. They're like, oh, well, if he's talking to these guys, he must know something. You know, I um, when I first met Leo, he said, why are you on Twit? What do you do again? And I'm like, oh, I met Lisa at a bar at South by Southwest, and she thought I was funny and smart, and she said I should be on Twit, so here I am. And that was the only reason I got on Twit for the first time, and I got to interview Leo. Um, and so, again, from those moments, um, people just see me, and then they hear the way that I interact with those Internet celebrity-type people, and I usually say at least one thing that's smart, and it works out for me. I, um, Case in point, a person I mentioned earlier, um, Jason Calacanis. He is notoriously like a very rude and generally mean and, and uh, direct individual. He's a New Yorker, so that's really what it is. So it is. He's not a bad guy. He's a New Yorker. And I've met him five or six times in passing and stuff, and people are like, oh, you got to watch out for him. He's kind of he's kind of rude. He's kind of mean. He's kind of aggressive. You know, you got to pay attention. He's aggressive. And he was always nice to me. And then one day, I took a flight from L.A. to San Francisco, and I got lucky. Again, trying to be a regular dude. They said, oh, you want first class for 35 bucks? I said, 35 bucks first class? Sure. I sit down first class, there's Jason Calacanis, he's sitting next to me. And I said, you know, Jay, why are you always so nice to me? People always tell me how aggressive you are. And he's like, people that I know that know you say you're a good guy, so I never wanted to mess with you because people always vouch for you and say you're a good guy. And then he tweeted out my website and shut my website down. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's what that was the day that I knew, like, I can make good money. Because <laughs> I never even spoke to that guy at that point. And I tried to avoid him because of the, the reputation that he had. And for him to say that to me, that validated the work that I've been doing, quote unquote, behind the scenes and in my interviews and shaking hands and kissing babies, that people valued what I was saying to them. So yeah. but, that but, was like, that was around 2010 when I, I started making money. I do want to add something here because the strategy that you described, this whole idea of, of pressing the flesh, of, of making those networking contacts, that's that's a well-known story. I mean, that's what you have to do to survive in pretty much any business. But there are people who I know who have who have tried that exact same strategy that you you just described of getting next to the people who are the taste makers, the decision makers, the people who are who are trending, who are hot, who are popular, and it doesn't work for them because they don't have the right personality or they don't have the right chutzpah. They don't have the the same view that actually can monetize the, those experiences that they just had. So. I think you short yourself a little bit just by saying, oh, it was just like I put myself next to famous people. Well, you have to have something. Otherwise, it doesn't doesn't mean anything, right? I have a secret tip for you. Uh-oh. The first thing that I have is that I'm black. And I don't know <laughs> if you know this about okay. a lot of these names and people that I've mentioned. They're all white men on the Internet. And most of them probably don't have a black friend. So by putting myself next to them, being somewhat not annoying and being awesomely funny and devastatingly handsome, they had to accept me because it's nice to have a black guy on your roster that's not annoying. So that helped a lot too. I, I really do believe that, that helped a lot. My my size and stature and the fact that I'm wearing a jersey, like my, if I have my business card, my business card says black, bald, and most likely wearing a jersey. Like I used to do that old school um, politician thing. I wore bright colored jerseys. I go to events and people are like, it was that guy in the red jersey. Everybody else is in suits. I'm walking around in an Eagles jersey or a Cardinals jersey. And pressing the flesh is one thing, but how many people walk up to a guy with your business card and their suit, right? Y'all look the same. Everybody looks the same. I was walking around in a jersey or a t-shirt or a bright colored shirt, and I just didn't look like anybody else. So even when I walked away from people, they remembered me, you know, and I never introduced myself as Owen. I was always O-Doctor, you know, because people have been calling me O-Doctor since high school. I, I just, I, I, I had a different kind of name. That was before everybody had their name going and all the other kind of stuff. So, you know, you're right. Personality, I'm not selling myself short, but there are certain things that just worked out in my favor. I do believe that if I was a, 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 a lighter skinned gentleman and I was 85 pounds and wore a suit, that nobody would remember my name. Uh, I, I will say that I probably play a similar card. The fact that I'm a priest, I do most of my podcasts that's, in my That's definitely clerics. different. It's and it, it's not you know it's not a bad thing it's it's something that you can trade on as you said you've got it you have to have something that will raise your profile just a little bit so otherwise you're just noise and yeah. that works you're the only father I know on the internet so <laughs> that 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 puts you in a category all by yourself if somebody says something to me about the clergy or the internet or whatever you're the first person that's going to come to my mind from now on yeah yeah well, like I mean it, if you go to CES or NAB or Interop or to Google I/O uh, 92% sure 
that I'll be the only one walking around in clerics. Just, just you know, just out there. There you go. All right. Got to be different. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, do you mind if we, we go over some of the stories that I, I, I wanted to bring them to you because I thought you could bring a very interesting perspective on two hot stories for this past week uh, because they both involve the internet and they both involve sort of trending topics. I, I wanted to get the advice of Odokta. Let's do it. All right. This first one, you've probably heard about it. It got huge play around the nation, is all about Kurt Schilling. Uh, Kurt Schilling and his daughter, actually. So uh, Kurt Schilling tweeted a congratulation to his 17-year-old daughter, who was accepted into Salve Regina University and who would be pitching for their softball team. Now, within minutes, both his and his daughter Gabby's accounts were flooded. This was on Twitter. By horrible, sexually explicit, violent, and just absolutely despicable comments from a couple of trolls. And we actually just, we just spoke about this. You kind of expect this. If you've got a high profile and you tweet something, people who don't like you or don't like what you represent are just going to, they're going to flood the hate. Well, a lot of people, and, and you know, myself included, would either just ignore it or maybe make one response and then shut it down. That's not what Kurt Schilling did. What Kurt Schilling did was he went after the trolls. He went after two in particular who he was able to identify, and he doxed them. He went to dad mode, and uh, he publicly shamed them. One of them was a ticket seller for the New York Yankees, Sean McDonald, and he was fired. The other one was a college student by the name of Adam Nagel, who was first denounced by his fraternity and then suspended from his college oh, and fired from his DJ job. Now, oh, doctor, Kurt Schilling is a high-profile person. He's got, he's got uh, at least a couple of hundred thousand followers. People either love him or they hate him from his time playing baseball or they hate him from the time that he, he was the owner of a company that went bankrupt and took a lot of public money with it. But in this case, it's, it's kind of strange because he did the wrong thing. He poked the trolls. He fed the trolls. But everyone loves him for doing it. Why, why is that? What makes this different? Is it just because he was a father defending his daughter or is it because people really are sick of trolls? <sighs> I'd say it's a cross storm of those things. I mean, when you say you're not supposed to put trolls, again, it's depending on how he wants to handle it. I think he just retweeted the things that they were saying and pointed them out. Am I correct? Oh, no, no. I mean, he went He went further. I mean, he actually he found the identity of a couple of people. He posted their identity. And, uh, I mean, some of the tweets were kind of aggressive. It's, you know, no one follows you. It was, oh, oh yeah, he works here. Oh, I bet his his fraternity is oh. proud. Okay. So, I mean, he was so, he was actively trying to get these so, guys out. So first of all, I I didn't I, I read the tweets that people sent to him. I didn't see all the responses because the, the site that I looked at, the two sites I looked at, only showed what people were saying. Right, it didn't right. show what he responded to. So first of all, if he called them out, that's their fault for making themselves publicly available. I personally love trolls like that. I I love knowing that those people are out there. I love the fact that they go and say those dumb things. Here's why: if I live in a neighborhood with the KKK going. I, I'm okay with them burning crosses on my front yard because at least I know they're there. I don't want them sneaking up in my backyard and, and jacking me up in the middle of the night. I want to know what area I'm living in. So when those people come out and they say things like that, feel free to say dumb things on the internet. Go ahead and troll people because now someone's going to find you. Someone's going to look you up. Someone's going to get a hold of you. And unless you took a lot of time to make yourself invisible, which most of these people aren't smart enough to do, then you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your fraternity. You're going to lose your position. You're going to lose status. You're going to be ashamed. You're going to be embarrassed. You know, with the with the gamer gate, with the one girl who went and found the guy's mother and was uh, uh, shared the tweets with the guy's mother and said, "This is what your son's doing to women online." I love it. Go ahead and be dumb enough to say whatever you got to say online. As far as Schilling's concerned, it's I can't even fault him because it's his daughter. You know, um, first of all, if he really cared about the online presence, he wouldn't have messaged her online. She's 17. You call your daughter up, you say, congratulations for going, blah, blah, blah. You said that because you're trying to show off and be fancy for whatever reason. I mean, there's really, you really don't need to do that. But he did it. So he put her in the line of fire by making it public. You know, you call your daughter on the phone and say, hey, I love you, congratulations. What good did it do anybody besides him wanting praise? So by him wanting that praise, then you open yourself up to be shot at. You know, you want to run out in the street and say, I just made $100 million and I got it on me right now. There's a couple of people in that street that are going to come and try and take that money off your person. So, I, I mean, good for him, bad for him, good result on the people. And uh, hopefully it shows other people that they need to either, one, keep their mouth shut or make themselves more visible on the Internet 
but you can't really do that anymore. It's hard to do. We've got uh, Palace 486 in the chat room, and he I think he's taking your side. He's basically saying, look, Kurt was showing off. And, and when you show off, sometimes you're going to get some hate. And if you're going to show off in a public forum, you just accept the hate. Just, or, I mean, if you fight it back, it's, it's really your fault because you invited it in the first place. But again, you know, there, there is a little something here. There, there is, okay, there's the father defending the daughter. That's a good angle. But there's also, and this, is, this has been his tagline to this entire thing, which is, uh, what, where, where is that? Oh, that's right. There are repercussions to your actions in the real world. And that's one of those those battle cries that a lot of these anti-troll folks are trying to get out there, which is, look, you may feel like you're anonymous, but, and, and Kurt actually said this in this 1900-word essay that he penned, said, it took me all of 30 minutes to find out who you are. And, and like you said, you left trails, you left breadcrumbs, you let me find your identity, and if it was that easy for me to find your identity, you don't deserve anonymity. And if I, and if I I'll dox you because I don't operate under the same rules. Like, for example... I would never put out someone's private information. That's just one of those things. It's my training is multiple hats. I, I I wouldn't do that. But I guess you can get away with it if you don't know better. Well, my 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 real problem with this in general when I'm when I'm reading what you just put up on the screen is sadly, don't I live in a world of free speech? Yeah. Don't I live in a world where I get to say what I want to say? I mean, unless I sent it from the company account and I sent it from my job when I was getting paid from eight to five, can I sit at home and say, you suck? And I mean, regardless of how you think of what's vulgar is what's vulgar, I mean, vulgar to you and vulgar to me is two different things. Personally, just a side note, I don't like my mother. She's a horrible person, apparently. So if, when I was a kid, people say, oh, your mama this, your mama that, some kids would cry. I would laugh and be like, talk about my mama. Now, if you say something about my dad, I start crying, I rip your face off, and I freak out because that's what I place value on. So in a world of free speech, when you want to get to say, oh, my daughter, blah, 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 you kind of have to eat the fact that somebody says something bad about your daughter. And again, free speech, I guess he has a free speech to go say, well, this guy lives here. If somebody wants to fire him or whatever. But I mean, like, when people talk about all this trolling and bullying, grow, it's America. It's America. We are so sad anymore when it comes to now kids i understand when you're when you're a kid and you're a small kid i understand bullying and how you know you need to help a kid but when you're an adult and somebody says something to you whatever you know if somebody said the n-word to me i don't care i've been in places and, and hanging out with people and people think it's cool when they drop the n-word and they look at me to make sure it's okay me personally it doesn't bother me and i told one guy he said like three or four times and every time he said it, he looked at me i was like look dude it doesn't bother me personally and i'm okay with you saying it so keep saying it but I'm just warning you that if you get too comfortable saying it, you're going to say it in front of somebody who doesn't like it, and they're going to punch you in the face. So just so you know, you're not offending me. You're not getting a rise out of me. It's not affecting me. But somebody else, it's going to get to them. So we need to man up as people. Uh, uh, accept this bullying. A, a, a little bit thicker skin would help people. So on both sides, with bottom line, free speech, America. I thought we had free speech going on. And, and I hear that. Okay, and I, I totally hear that. And I, I also think that we need to get thicker skin there are a few cases where I think it obviously goes over the line uh, because we already know that free speech in the United States does not count. It does not cover fighting words. Fighting words are not covered as free speech. You may have the right to say them. You do not have the right not to suffer the consequences for them. It doesn't cover hate speech. It also doesn't cover slander. So, I mean, that sort of bullying is in a different category. If you're saying something that is untrue, trying to ruin the reputation of someone, that's not protected speech. If you are calling someone out and trying to provoke a fight or pro trying to provoke hate, that's not covered under free speech. If you are trying to, to intimidate people into not ex exercising their right to free speech, that's not protected. But I think you're right. I think we, we do swing the other way where someone says something that is absolutely asinine. It's stupid. We all know it's stupid, and they should feel bad for saying it, and we can shame them. But then something else happens, like they lose their job or they, you know, get ostracized by their community. And you start to think, did, is the punishment, does that fit the crime here? And was there really a crime? Because being stupid isn't necessarily a crime in this country. Yeah. It, again, like that's the thing where it's like, it's such a fine line. Like, again, all the things you said are correct. But I'll also say there's a lot of things that people do where that line is so blurred anymore, people don't even know what's going on. 
not, half the articles you read online could be considered slander when Sony has a big debacle and people say the death of Sony, this company's reputation is ruined and they write how horrible this company is and they're legitimate businesses writing about how bad something is when it's a forecast of how bad something is. Some things blow over, but in our age of clickbait, we dramatize so much stuff and, and rip apart people and companies and things all the time. That could be considered slander. And nobody does anything about it. It's accepted in the personal norm of the way the country functions now, you know? So as much as I said, people need to have a thick skin, everybody's sarcastic now. You know, I, I watch I watch commercials with my daughter. I don't find anything funny anymore. She laughs at stuff and I say to myself, man, I wish I was that innocent. I wish that I could find joy in these simple things, but I know it's a horrible ploy at a commercial and they're not gonna get me to buy their crap. But for a kid, she, she loves it. So this whole conversation is just one of those things where it's like, man, great job, Chris Schilling. Oh, you messed up. And then why do you talk about your 17-year-old daughter? And you should have been talking about a 17-year-old girl like that. And wait a minute, you lost your job? He needs to feed his family. You couldn't have just slapped him on the wrist. Why did Twitter just delete his account? I don't really know what's going on. There are so many different avenues of quote-unquote right and wrong in every one of these situations that it's just amusing. And again, that's why like I get to sit on, I, I sit on phone calls sometimes and people want to, oh, let's promote this company this way, let's promote this company that way. And I'm like, you know you don't want to do that, right? Because if you want to set up a, a meme generator right now, that's the worst idea in the world because people are smarter than you. People are smarter than me. And within 30 seconds, somebody's going to put something on one of those things. It's going to go viral and it's going to crack everybody up and it's going to make you look really bad. So that whole conversation is such a dance to where it's like, I agree and I disagree and I want to be able to say what I want to say. And I know I can't say what I want to say. It, it's political, correct conversations. It's, it's just a bad thing. You know, why can't everybody be nice? Why can't we just keep it like that? Everybody's nice. Just no one be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. Yeah. We'll all get along. Yeah. And if you want to be a jerk, do it behind closed doors. You know, it, it's the same, like I said, like I, the same thing like what I say with that N-word. You know, if people want to sit around and dislike a certain color or a certain race, that's great. Go do it in your house by yourself. Don't bother me with it, you know? Um, there was a KKK rally in, in Delaware. My friend's a cop, and he's like, I had to stand out there and protect these guys. He's a black cop. And he's like, I had to stand out there and protect them. And he's like, half the people in the force didn't want to do it because they don't want to protect them. But I'm like, it's my job because they want to hold a rally or a thing in a park, and they rented the park, and it's free speech. Again, like you said, as long as they're not fighting anybody or doing anything wrong, they're allowed to do it. And I, it's my job to protect them. And I'm like... Man, that's a tough job, boy. <laughs> America is a weird place. All those situations are so strange and fluid. So, yeah. you know, take it take for granted. Just, just like you said, don't be a jerk. And if you are going to be a jerk, you, you might get fired now because that's where it's going anymore. When you get caught, you know, the way he went straight to the person's job, like, you know, if you people need a job right now. So watch what you say, especially the, the guy who was selling tickets. Like, you work for another team. What are you doing? Like, I... People, especially with sports and all famous people, people lose their mind for about 30 seconds and they wish they could take it back. And sometimes you can't. I mean, those guys didn't. They went over when I saw those tweets. They kept going and going and going. But, you know, again, he, he put himself out there. Don't talk about your daughter if you, if you don't want hear anything about her. Yeah, there, there's one thing to make one stupid comment. It's another thing when you realize, no, this is like a concerted effort. They're, they're, they yeah. keep going back at this. That's obviously out of, out of, off limits. And, and, you know, I, I will say this. I, I think I finally realized that I've somewhat made it doing this, this internet podcasting, broadcasting thing when I started getting haters. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I never had yeah. that before. <laughs> if nobody likes you, then you're, not, you're doing something wrong. If everybody likes you, you're not doing something right because right. everybody can't be agreeable with what you're saying. Now, oh, um, doctor. And, are you willing to come with me a little bit to a, a darker side of the internet that uh, I know you have some some mojo in? I live in the dark internet. All right. Let's go. Let's talk a little bit about sock puppets. So there, there, you could say that, that the use of anonymous accounts, sock puppets, voice amplification, message amplification is bad. It's the subversion of democracy. But... We all know what happens. It, I mean, brands do it. Individuals I've, do I've, it. I've done it. You've done it. Right. And, and it's, Gorilla, it's... Gorilla warfare. Ex, okay. So let, let's do the, the 101. What is sock puppetry 101 for, for the internet? When uh, you hire a click farm out in Korea and they post 80,000 comments on a Samsung site 
saying that Samsung phones are the best phones and this is why they're the best phones. And then somebody gets caught because all the comments came in at the same exact time. And why did you do that? You couldn't have parsed them out a little bit. You had them all come from the same place. Some people having one letter off of their usernames. I mean, that that's the most extreme public when somebody got caught. I remember when, when Samsung got caught doing that. They they had a new phone. They were trying to push it. And I'm sure they do it all the time. But this is the one time they got caught because they went overboard. You know, they they had a place where they had 40 or 50 people that their job was to go and make comments on every single blog post, every single like you could literally go from the verge to Reddit to anywhere. And the same usernames were all over saying the same cut and paste thing. And it's cool when you sparse it out or if you if you actually say something different. But, you know, the NFL's got caught doing it. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of places do it now. Politics. Every yeah, campaign that, does and, it. And NCAA, when they were trying to not have a playoff system, they would they were paying a PR company to go to every site saying, we don't want a playoff system. We don't want a playoff system. And they got caught doing it. And now they have a playoff system because for a long time, I, how long were they going around paying people to do that, keeping it seeming like, well, the fans don't want this. The fans don't want this. How much money were they spending doing that? Because once they got caught, a year later, now we got a playoff system because they had no fan rebuttal to go to all these sites and tell people how horrible they are. So, right. so I'm pumping it in some sneaky stuff. I call it guerrilla warfare. You got to be out here in the jungle. They can't see you. You just got to run up on people. Well, th th there's a funny part here. There's, there's some people who say, oh, well, that's just astonished. That's, you know, you can't do that. Dude. You, that but there are others who are saying, well, look, everyone's doing it. And this is a defensive measure. Uh, and, and honestly, sock puppetry, astroturfing, doesn't work unless there's at least a little kernel of truth. You can't hire an army of people to say, you know what, it's awesome to be killed. I wish I could get killed today. The, you have to take something that people will agree with at least a little bit before you start creating consensus. Uh, now, I, I, I don't do this. Um, I have done PR management campaigns. I, I go for, for the Catholic Church. I go a slightly different route. But I understand the dynamics of it, and I understand how it works. And the interesting thing is, once you've worked a little bit in this field, you actually start to see the patterns. I mean, have, are you like Neo in the Matrix, oh, Doctor? Do you look at a, a PR campaign, you go, oh, okay, I see what they're doing, I see what they're doing, oh, oh, okay, that's an interesting move. That, that's literally what it is. You know, it, it's any, there's certain companies that don't care. They, they have to do that. Like you said, there's a kernel of truth to it, and there's just, you know, the people that are, Apple is the best thing in the world. Windows is the best thing in the world. Well, Windows is the worst thing in the world. Apple is the worst thing in the world. There's always that 50-50. But for some companies, it could be a swing vote to get people to like them and be on their side if they just have a push or a wave that comes in and says, hey, maybe you like A or B or C. And I see that stuff all the time. The, the new thing that's going on is um, social guilt. Mm. So Explain. Um, social guilt. <laughs> social guilt. So let's say... P&G, Johnson Johnson, uh, wants to say, well, we want a million followers on our Facebook. If you click like on our Facebook page, we're going to donate a dollar to water charity. Guess what? People do that. Do you know why they do that? Because they're like, I'm not donating a dollar to anybody because I don't have a dollar. But I saw this thing. They had a pink heart up there with a bunny rabbit. I'm going to click it. And they click it. Now, how much water somebody really ends up getting um, where, where all the money actually goes, if people even send the money, nobody ever really knows. I mean, obviously, I, I, when I say PNG, not to be uh, talking about a company, but I'm sure they do everything they're supposed to do. But let's just say there's companies that don't or people that don't. You know, I, I saw a TV commercial the other day where they're like, oh, if you follow us on Twitter, we're going to send water to women in developing countries. And I instantly thought, so you're only going to give water to women in developing countries? The kids can't get no water. The men can't get no water. You're going to specifically give water to women. And is there an island somewhere that I need to be visiting? Because how do you just say you're only giving water to women in developing countries? You, and there's things like that that are like, you can't say that. That's not, that's not real. But they do it. You can almost hear the focus group that they had. So they were testing out words. And the words that tested were developing country, woman, clean water. And so, like, well, we have to have all that in one campaign. And that's that yeah. I've been part of those focus groups. So, yeah, I know that's actually how it works. Yeah. So what, it, I oh. see things like that. And I'm like, man, it, oh God, you're killing me. And I it, I feel like, are you scamming people? Are you really doing what you're supposed to do? And it's it's really bad anymore because you can't trust anybody.
which is the same thing I said about my daughter. I'm so jaded, and like you said about seeing the Matrix, everything I see, I take with a grain of salt. You know, I, I can't trust anybody. I don't even know if you're a real father. I don't know. I haven't seen any credentials. You know what I mean? I, I got I, I to gotta go follow you somewhere and find out, make sure you're legit padre. So, you know, it, it, it makes it so I'm like so skeptical about everything I see because when you see those things, it's like, man, you're trying to scam people. And like I said, now the new thing is that social pressure. Like, oh, do something good for free when really you're doing something for them. Yeah. But uh, actually, I, li I like that last bit. You know, that last bit of you do this for a living. And so now you know, you understand that you got to dig a little bit. Dig a little bit and find out what's actually real. See what, what's underneath the message that they're trying to give you. Uh, I like that. I mean, if there's one thing that you can impart to our audience, and in fact, impart to anyone who might listen to anything, is take the message and then figure out what's behind it. Uh, that's great advice. Yeah, because there's got to be something that has value to you, or if you care. You know, uh, when I hear things about breast cancer, I think to myself, man, the NFL, the NBA, they donate, just them alone, they donate so much money every year. I don't really see any progress. I don't know what's going on. All I know is they throw all this money at the situation, and then you got to hear about executives getting paid this and people getting paid that, and, you know, they're throwing parties for this, and how much money do they spend to even raise the money that they have the money, and how much money even goes to help a person or a family? You know, what about all the people that, well, now you're supposed to have universal health care, but before, what about people who couldn't pay their bills? Shouldn't some of that money go to them to help people that actually have breast cancer since obviously your research isn't doing any good? I mean, there's all kinds of things where it's like, what real value are you getting for that like or that dollar that you put into something? So it's uh, it's one of those situations. And personally, like, I have to hold myself back because I tell people all the time, like, I care about everything. I don't care about anything at all. You know, if my house caught on fire right now, I'd grab my dog and my hard drive and I'd walk out and whatever. I don't care. You know what I mean? Um, physical things don't bother me. Like, it just doesn't affect me. I, I'll buy new stuff. It's not, it's not a big deal. But, um, you know, if my daughter, like, cut her hand off or something, I'd, I'd probably kill myself because I don't know what I'd do. I'd freak out because that's, like, my little person, and it, there's something to that. So when you're sitting there with companies, sometimes they say stuff, and it's real shady, and I just got to be like, yeah, okay, we can do that. You know, and you just got to go along with it, even though you know it's, quote, unquote, not right. But th that's not my job. My job is not Captain Moral Compass. I mean, there are limits to things I'll do, obviously, but sometimes you just got to sit there and be like, yeah, I guess, you got because you have to trick people anymore. Because it's not just me that's skeptical. A lot of people are sitting at home not wanting to buy into your advertisement or your campaign or your ideas. And maybe sometimes you have a good idea, but you just got to trick people into coming to it. There you have it, folks. That's the secret. Don't trust anyone except Twit and Oh Doctor. Oh Doctor, Owen, J.J. Stone, I want to thank you so very much for being on Padres Corner. This, this has been absolutely a blast. This has been fun. This has been educational. I'm going to have to have you back on at some point. I'm going to put you in a panel because, well, you know, it's nice to have a, a word of wisdom every once in a while. Now, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? I and, mean, of course, they're going to find you on Twitter at Odocta, but where can they find some of your work? Or if there's someone listening who said, you know what, this is the man whose wisdom I need, where might he contact you? Um, you can go to ONJJStone.com. It's just set up to an About Me page. It's got my email on it, my ninja address, which is my real address, and my phone number, which is a Google voice. People can call me. They can send me mail. They can come hang out, live the dream. Um, and as far as people contacting me, it's really funny because, like, even the last time when I was on Twitter, uh, a guy contacted me. He was a comedian. He's like, I don't know if you do this, but blah, 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 blah. And I love emails like that. I love questions. Somebody in the chat room made me the happiest person in the world because they said, Oh, it's nice that the guy's being truthful and honest and open about stuff. That's just how I do. I love being that way. Um, my business site is iqmz.com, but I'm actually changing it over to something else. I think I might try and start my own twit and create a broadcast nation and just sit around and talk all day. So I don't know. But that's my website that I've had for forever. And I, I guess every three or four years, I change it into something else. And uh, you can find me. I'm on the Internet. People, <laughs> people find me. It's, it's not I'm not hiding from anybody. He's the internet doctor. Oh, doctor, again, thank you, sir. And uh, I, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Now, uh, go get some rest. Rest? What time is it? It's only 9 o'clock here. I'm good. It's early. All right. Okay. I, I don't think I want to know what the night holds for the doctor. <laughs> we'll see you next time here on Padres Corner. Uh, folks, this is the end of this episode of Padres Corner. But, uh, you know, there's always a place to get 
our episodes. If you've missed one, if you want to see the notes from one, if you want to see a link to a story that we covered in a previous episode of Padres Corner, you can always find it by going to our show page at twit.tv slash Padre. While you're there, go ahead and download all of our back episodes and subscribe. That's right. We've got a little function here that will give you every episode of Padres Corner automatically in the format of your choice in the device of your choice. It's one of the things that we do because, well, we love you. Also, don't forget that you can find me on Twitter. If you want to know who's going to be on every episode of Padres Corner, follow me at twitter.com slash Padre SJ. That's at Padre SJ. If you follow me there, you'll find out who I'm going to have on Padres Corner, what we're going to be talking about on Know How or This Week in Enterprise Tech, what products you're going to find on Before You Buy, or uh, what we're going to be programming for Coding 101. Again, it's a great way to find out what I do when I'm not here on the live stream. I also want to thank everyone who makes Padres Corner possible. Of course, that's Leo, that's Lisa, that's everyone here in the Brick House, all the engineers and all the TDs who make all of this possible, but most of all, to you. Because if you didn't come back each and every single week, we wouldn't have a show. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, and you've come out sane on the other side. <laughs>